ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and welcome to this uh, reality check. The um, series, uh, Security in Law Reality Check, is a public uh, event series that explores how international law matters in security affairs. But I think more importantly, it's a uh, venue for debate, a regular debate, to be critical, not skeptical, not cynical, but critical so we can make better policies and make better um, decisions. And today we're exploring the complexities of hybrid warfare. We read every day in the news about cyber operations, fake news, foreign intervention, and much more. And we're also witnessing um, emerging, but also protracted uh, conflicts around the globe. And so mostly NATO and the European Union and its member states, they're increasingly talking about hybrid uh, warfare. And that raises the question, well, what is hybrid warfare? What is this? And more importantly, what can we do and what shall be done uh, with this new concept called hybrid warfare? And now we here today, involved in international cooperation in Geneva, is there something to be done concerning hybrid warfare, and if so, what exactly? Now, to be fairly straightforward, we don't have the answers, but at least we have the questions. So I think that's already a good starting point. And we also have two brilliant minds here, uh, two experts here today at uh, GCSP. We're honored to have Ambassador Miko Kinunen and Dr. Aurel Sari here with us today. Ambassador Kinunen is Finland's first ambassador for hybrid issues and countering hybrid threats. He is supporting Finland to build a foreign policy and security policy in countering hybrid threats and promoting international cooperation in this topic. Ambassador Kinunen was director of the Unit for Security Policy and Crisis Management at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. And in his long and very accomplished career, he has served on numerous uh, posts, including Kazakhstan, Russia, the US, and at the United Nations in New York. Well, the explanation, the explanation for this successful career is, of course, he is a proud GCSP alumna. So thank you for being here. Dr. Aula Sari, he is Senior Lecturer and Director of the Exeter Center for International Law. Dr. Sari is also a Fellow of Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, as well as the Allied Rapid <coughs> Reaction Courts and the European Center of Excellence on Hybrid uh, Warfare, Hybrid Issues, I'm sorry, Hybrid okay. Threats. Common Hybrid Threats, okay, so the Center of Excellence, that's what we call it and its uh, definition per se. Um, he has published widely on international humanitarian law, status of force agreements, and much more. And most importantly, today, he's one of the leading thinkers uh, who work on the legalities of hybrid warfare and hybrid threats, legal resilience, uh, and other related topics. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here um, with us uh, today. So I would suggest that we delve into the reason why we're here today, namely substantive debate. And I'll ask a couple of questions to our distinguished panelists, but then really give the word to the most important people in the room here, uh, and that is you, our distinguished uh, guests. So please, just jump up, jump up, um, jump in with whatever is on your mind, uh, and I think uh, that's what we're here for, and we're really honored uh, to see you here and to welcome you here um, today. So if I may start uh, to Ambassador Kinunen, where is the question, what is hybrid warfare? Uh, what are hybrid threats? How do they manifest? Um, and the big question from a strategic point of view, uh, does hybrid warfare actually pose a threat to international security uh, and peace? And if we want to be a little bit critical, are we just talking of, of a hype based on experiences uh, from European states? Or is this really more to it? Is this a new concept? Do we need new, new thinking, uh, etc.? cetera? So uh, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Tobia, Tobias. Thank you for organizing this event. It is great to be here, and I'm happy that you did not uh, actually promise uh, answers. I, I think there are questions, and there will even be more questions. Nevertheless, all of us who deal with security, meaning that we are responsible um, building security to our people, to our region globally, I think uh, hybrid threats is also one issue that we presently do need to think. Uh, um, as it was mentioned, I was honored to study here 2003, 2000, sorry, 2002 and 3, um, 
uh, for nine months at the uh, GCSB at that time. Um, <clears throat> that was after 9-11, and I think at that time the new paradigm sort of was something that was called as apocalyptic terrorism. Uh, I argue that, again, uh, we do have a new paradigm in, in security that we need to think what it means. Uh, hybrid uh, warfare, hybrid threats, hybrid influencing, hybrid thing, um, name is very unfortunate and elusive. Uh, I think... Uh, there are some synonyms that are better in some countries. One speaks about hyper, uh, hostile interference, about malign influencing, or unwanted foreign interference, hostile state influencing. Uh, in the two last ones, I think this foreign and especially uh, state influencing uh, gives a glue. For me, I think important point is uh, that uh, hybrid uh, influencing warfare is something. It's not just domestic political meddling, but it is something that there is uh, a, a third country uh, behind it. Unfortunately, this hybrid issue is a thing that uh, divides us. It's a threat-based issue. Uh, it is important to be actor agnostic or state agnostic in a sense that we are countering phenomena. We are not uh, countering any uh, actors, uh, any states per se. Obviously, if there is a phenomenon and then behind it you'll find a country uh, at your will, you need to be able to name, to attribute. Uh, so when did uh, hybrid influencing, hybrid war actually start? I think uh, hybrid, our present hybrid uh, environment did not start in 2014, but 2014 was time when um, our eyes were opened, or actually I think in many countries, including Finland, we uh, started wearing new glasses, started looking at things from a uh, hybrid perspective. Um, obviously, I mean, I'm speaking of um, occupation, illegal annexation of Crimea, the start of the war in eastern Ukraine. Uh, ISIL could be mentioned as well. But at the same time, uh, this present hybrid uh, uh, environment, I, I, I think, would date at least maybe 10 years back. And also, if we speak of hybrid warfare, I, I don't think there is nothing new, because if any country, including mine, is in war, I think then we would uh, creatively use wide specter of elements that any country has available. Obviously, there are sort of uh, uh, international humanitarian law and other laws on, on warfare. But then again, now I'm speaking on, on peacetime issues. If I speak of you, hybrid warfare, for example, uh, Crimea, or uh, hybrid warfare was uh, uh, when uh, about 3,000 years ago, city of Troja was uh, occupied with the use of a, um, this uh, fake um, horse. Uh, warfare is one thing, but if we speak of uh, meddling to the elections, uh, if we speak of uh, using economic means uh, to gain uh, illegal advantage, I would not call it warfare. I would all, uh, call hybrid influencing, because I think for all of us, when we have when we carry on our discussions, uh, just for the clarity's sake, it is better to separate war and, and not war uh, items. Election, interference, and I think that's only been taking place ever since 2016. It's a rather new thing, uh, and it would, not, it would not have to continue. Uh, election interference is, is, I think, one uh, typical example of uh, uh, hybrid influencing. There you would see different tools uh, and different goals in different places. Uh, one basic model I think would be uh, hack, steal, perhaps manipulate, but then uh, leak or publicize and destroy, meaning that in one typical model you would illegally uh, steal data from, from a political party or political campaign, uh, then at a critical moment of an election cycle, you would publicize it in order to try to uh, destroy a, a candidate or a party. Uh, there are several other models as well, but I think this is what we've seen in the United States. This is what we've seen in the, uh, France. Use of uh, irregular migration, refugee issues throughout 
Europe and other places, I think is another unfortunate element that we are being targeted on, meaning that our societies are already divided, but this uh, issue is being targeted and tried to exploit in order to divide us further, in order to d divide, for example, the EU. Now for the uh, <coughs> hybrid influencing, there is no single definition. Uh, we can speak about this later. I don't think there needs to be one uh, because it, it moves all the time. Um, for me, uh, it's important to be able to uh, uh, operationalize it work operationally, meaning that uh, uh, <clears throat> I think we're speaking of hybrid influencing. For example, if uh, someone is targeting my country using tools uh, or having goals in mind that are illegal, or somebody is using something that is against international law, or uh, something that is uh, clearly um, contrary to the sovereignty of our country, uh, or for example, if it clearly worsens uh, the um, security of our uh, people. In that, th th these are some examples when I think any country, if this country so wishes, could come out and say that, hey, this is what is happening and uh, uh, we think it is unacceptable. And then if one wishes, one can attribute it. We, for example, uh, attributed this uh, GPS uh, jamming in Finland in November, uh, saying that it emanated uh, from Russia. So I think uh, from foreign security policy point of view, we wish to clear, create something instead of a definition that enables us to be operational. Now, speaking of <coughs> foreign security policy, obviously threats, violence, bad things, they do not exist in, in a vacuum. So the present hybrid threats, hybrid warfare, I think is clearly connected to the uh, worsened security situation in Europe, or it can be connected also to un use of unacceptable cyber tools for economic gain by some countries. And clearly, present hybrid threats is connected to the technological uh, development, a rapid one, that is taking place uh, today. So, uh, if countries always have tried, and this is not um, soft power. Soft power is different. This is malign. If countries have always uh, tried to do malign things on other countries as well, I think now it has intensified. It is more multifaceted, uses wider. And digitalization, I think, is one thing. Uh, digitalization, I think, is a good thing because it enables um, us to be more accurate. It saves cost, limits the human error, uh, decreases corruption, but at the same time it creates vul new vulnerabilities that we don't necessarily <coughs> understand. Uh, when everything is being digitalized that can be digitalized, then one day we'll start asking, are there things that we do not want to digitalize in our societies? Uh, I think elections or, or casting the last ballot, ballot is, is one in, in many countries, uh, not in all. But really, this uh, digitalization, I think, creates vulnerabilities from critical infrastructure to our brains. Because I think um, through uh, our, our cognition, our thinking, the way we build our heads can also be targeted in a new uh, way through technological development, uh, through social media and other issues. Finally, I wish to argue that this issue is uh, uh, global. We are running into this issue in uh, Australasia, in Americas, in Africa, in Asia. Normally there is a state behind it uh, or a pseudo state. Uh, I mean, I still, uh, there will be several examples on that. I think someone uh, might name Hezbollah as well. But I think issue is global uh, and it takes several forms in different countries and the different uh, actors use different tools in hybrid influencing in different places. Obviously, when I'm speaking coming from Finland, uh, I think uh, my geographic location and sort of more immediate security challenges, they define what type of examples I give. Uh, thanks. Uh. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So, so really, it's, it's, it's a, an emergence of, of, of actions with divisive uh, nature. It's an emergence around the globe, and also that, that includes vulnerabilities. So, 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 
how is that from a legal perspective, from the legal dimension? Is there, uh, w what are the legalities? Is everything clear from a legal perspective? You mentioned uh, the different laws, or is everything actually unclear? Um, and again, from a strategic point of view, policymakers often say that international law doesn't really matter in security affairs anyhow. Uh, uh, so should we care or should we not care? How, what is your take on that, uh, Dr. Sauer? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for, uh, it's great to be here back in uh, Geneva. I haven't studied here, so I, unfortunately I uh, can't claim, claim that uh, link. I'm still young. I can maybe, 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 maybe next year I'll come back and, and do an LLM. Um, but to answer the questions, to answer the question, there were a couple of questions, uh, Tobias, that you raised. Uh, in particular, I think the, uh, the first issue is what are the legal challenges, what are the legal aspects of hybrid warfare? I'm grateful for the ambassador for uh, talking us through some of the definitions and some of the problems that we have with that word and that concept of, of hybrid warfare, hybrid threats, malign influence. But I think uh, I agree with the ambassador that we certainly need to have some kind of a working definition in order to tackle the problem. We need to define the problem so that we can think about solutions. So when we go back to how hybrid warfare as a concept was used, it was first used in a very narrow sense. It was very much used by the military in order to describe a particular type of warfare, an evolution in the character of war. Frank Hoffman, I'm, I'm sure some of you will have heard the name, coined together with uh, Jim Mattis, General Jim Mattis, this idea of hybrid wars, essentially trying to describe a situation where we find either conventional adversaries, states, or non-state actors, very capable non-state actors, that are combining conventional methods of warfare, so they're combining normal troops, normal um, methods of, of armed conflict with uncon unconventional ways of waging war. So you can think about hybrid warfare, that construct of hybrid warfare, as kind of plain war which is reaching down. It is reaching down into different types of instruments. It is utilizing irregular forces. It is ut utilizing non-kinetic ways of, uh, of exercising influence on the battlefield as well as off the battlefield. So the key point here is that hybrid warfare in that narrow sense is very much a type of war. It's associated and cannot really be, di be divorced from the notion of armed conflict. So if we are looking at that from a legal perspective, it doesn't actually raise that many new or novel issues, I would suggest. It raises some of the classic problems that we have been, certainly we as the legal community, have been looking at over the last decade or perhaps two decades. So for instance, if you look at the use of force, we are looking at questions under what circumstances can a state use force against non-state actors, under what circumstances can a state use force against non-state actors in the territory of a third state, the unable or unwilling test, for example, what constitutes the use of force, what constitu constitutes uh, an armed conflict. So hybrid warfare in that narrow sense raises pretty classic questions of international law both as regards the use of force, but also if you look at the law of armed conflict, and I see a couple of familiar faces uh, and, and experts in this particular branch of international law, under the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law, very similar issues would arise. For example, what can be done by states? What sort of authorities do states actually have on the battlefield in non-international armed conflicts against non-state actors, for example? So I don't think there's too many new issues here. Again, these are very important, and I shouldn't you know, skip over this. These are important questions, they're important dilemmas which have not conclusively been resolved, but they're not necessarily novel, and I would suggest that they're not even tied to hybridity. Now, there is a broader concept or a broader understanding of hybrid war warfare, which I think is the one more currently being used and the one which is at this point in time dominant. And that this is the concept which has been uh, which has arisen essentially since uh, Russia's annexation of, of Ukraine. So even though hybrid warfare hasn't started, if we will, in 2014, certainly the concept itself has become far more popular since 2014. So how is this concept, the second way in which you understand hybrid warfare, how is it broader? Well, essentially, it is no longer tied to war. And this is, I think, where, where we have one of the main definitional problems in, in getting to grips with this concept, because hybridity here refers to the use of the full spectrum of state powers. And just as the ambassador was saying, states have always done this. And of, of course, non-state actors will uh, have done the same. They are using regular, irregular, military, non-military, kinetic, non-kinetic forms of levers of power to exercise their influence. So again, there's nothing new here, ultimately. Essentially, what this broad concept is describing is statecraft. It is describing the comprehensive approach 
to statecraft, i.e. where states or other actors are basically using all tools available to them. So what kind of legal challenges does that raise? Well, essentially, pick whatever your favorite legal challenge is. I mean, we are talking about statecraft, we're talking about strategic decision making, we're talking about strategic competition. So we can talk about the legal challenges posed in the cyber domain, we can talk about space, we can talk about disinformation, the laws of armed conflict, the use of force. So essentially, the problem that, again, as a lawyer, I face with that particular very broad use of, uh, of hybrid warfare or hybrid threats, I mean, just notice that particular phrase as well. A lot of actors, the EU in particular, are talking about hybrid threats, which again broadens it out even more. Essentially, everything and anything is part of that concept. Now, having said all of that, if you look at how the European Union and how NATO, for example, have been framing these concepts and what kind of legal challenges they have identified. There are a couple of statements, a couple of uh, uh, European Council conclusions, for example, or uh, uh, communiques of NATO, where we actually identify two themes. We can pick out two themes that EU and NATO have been worrying about, and of course, some of their member states. The first theme, legal theme, is that adversaries seem to be instrumentalizing the law. They're instrumentalizing international law and perhaps to a lesser extent domestic law in order, first of all, to legitimize their own actions and to maintain their own freedom of maneuver. And at the same time, they're using law as an instrument to delegitimize the actions of their adversaries and to constrain their freedom of maneuver. So, for example, if we take uh, the annexation of Crimea, Russia has been using law, legal arguments, legal instruments precisely for this dual purpose, to legitimize, justify its own activities and equally to legitimize the activities of, of its real or perceived uh, enemies and adversaries. So that's the first theme, this instrumental use of, of the law as part of hybrid warfare. The second theme that emerges is that the line between war and peace is blurring. And you might have picked this up. A lot of politicians quite frequently talk about the line between peace and war is becoming ever more blurred. You find European politicians, you find uh, within NATO, the Secretary General, for example, has uh, repeatedly made this point, And you also find politicians at the national level making this argument. Now, it's an interesting point to make because we can probably go back historically and just like hybrid warfare, hybrid threats arguably is nothing new. States have always combined various means of, of exercising influence. In the same way, that sort of line between war and peace was never actually that clear to begin with. Nonetheless, it is a very common recurring theme and what it points to is precisely this, this fear that adversaries are utilizing not just the classic means on the battlefield, but for example, they are weaponizing social media, leading to fake news, disinformation, and therefore, although the, the hybridity, if you will, is not new, the instruments, the strategic situation that we find ourselves in is in fact new. And I think this idea of the blurring line between war and peace is, uh, is, is highlighting that. And Tobias, you, uh, you raised another question of uh, policymakers very often dismissing international law as, as being irrelevant. Of course, those of you who, are, who study international law or work in international law, you'll be familiar with, uh, with the skepticism that we often face about international law not actually being proper law. Um, I'm, should I only say John Bolton, the National Security Advisor of the United States of America, for example, has taken this view. So there's a very rich tradition of skepticism that international law doesn't really work, it's not very effective, and of course it's if, you, if you listen to classic realists, they would go even further and say not only does international law not really work, not only is it ineffective, not only is it not proper law, like we expect it to be at the domestic level, but actually it is dangerous to believe in legalism. It's very dangerous for decision makers to believe that rules can actually constrain state power. And if we look back on the last, say, five years or 10 years, or 15, then aren't we all a bit feeling a bit queasy about this? Maybe, maybe there is a grain of truth in there, actually, law and norms are not quite capable of constraining power in the way that we would like them to do. Now what I would suggest to you is that this very realist perspective has some grains of truth in it, certainly, but actually it's mistaken on two fronts. 
Number one, if you go along with Louis Hankin, um, who very famously said, and I can't quite quote his famous line, but uh, as many of you will remember, he said that most states comply with most rules of international law most of the time. And I think that's a very important point to realize that if we move away from the big headlines, if we move away from the Kurt Strait, from Crimea, from the South China Seas, for example, then actually we do just continue to see a lot of compliance in international law. So all isn't bad. That's point number one. But for our purposes, I think the more important point to remember is what I said earlier, states instrumentalize the law. And that's very interesting or absurdly even, a point that many realists are, are failing to see. States instrumentalize international law for their own purposes. Take Russia again as an example. Russia did not just march into Crimea and annex Crimea with a reference to the Malian dialogue, we are the stronger ones and we don't have to care. No, Russia offered a legal justification as to why it, on its own view, it was uh, permitted to take those steps. Russia utilized certain instruments of international law in order to implement the annexation. For example, it used the instrument of recognition, state recognition. It concluded a treaty, so it used legal instruments in order to get its way. In the same way, in response, other states have been utilizing international law. For example, the whole sanctions regime is based on, and, and the whole sanctions regime continues to uh, be in existence on the basis that we characterize Russia's annexation of Korea, Crimea as unlawful. So international law, of course, is a weaker system than we, uh, we would like it to be, but nonetheless, it continues to play an incredibly important role in shaping state behavior. It might not constrain state behavior, but it certainly shapes the way that states operate. Thank you very much for, for, for these very uh, interesting insights and thoughts. So we're, we're, we're still something in between legal clarity, but still in clarity, and I think that's, that, that's where the, the interesting part uh, comes uh, from and, and, and leads us. Uh, Ambassador, you've mentioned operationalizing a concept. I think from a from policy or decision maker's point of view, that is the essence of, of, of policy making, um, having <coughs> concepts, but what, are, what, what to do with, with, with these concepts. So what is your, your take? Um, what role does foreign policy and security policy uh, uh, play uh, with uh, regard to addressing then now all uh, these, these issues? And, and most importantly for our discussions today, uh, international cooperation, where do you see challenges, where do you see, actually see opportunities? And Geneva, if we say not everyone will agree, but let's uh, agree on that uh, today, that Geneva is the, 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 the major hub for international humanitarian law, human rights, uh, and, and disarmament. Uh, what, what, are, what are your lines of, of, of actions that could be possible? How Geneva-based institutions, diplomacy, could actually try to address, or maybe not even should, but that's, what is your take on, on, on try to address uh, the threats, the issues that come out of, of that emerging practice, and, and eventually um, try in its own ways to, to, to contribute to peace and security? Uh, thanks <coughs> again for a good set of questions. Um, I think my argument is, uh, but I might be wrong and you can prove me. I mean, I was saying that uh, for all of us, we do need to think what do hybrid threats, hybrid this and that, how, how do they impact or what do they mean to our work? But uh, my instinct is that uh, uh, Geneva being one of the four capitals of the UN system, uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, and there is a difference between hybrid and cyber, I will tell you, but I think the... Um, um, it's not so relevant to Geneva than it is to Brussels uh, being capital of the uh, EU or NATO. And, and speaking of capitals, I'm, I'm always happy to hear uh, uh, notions to, to, to Helsinki, center of excellence on countering hybrid threats. I think Helsinki is one of the emerging counter hybrid uh, capitals. Here I want to emphasize the word counter always because we would not do hybrid uh, things during the peacetime. Um, international cooperation. Operationalization. <laughs> I'll tell you one example, I think a concrete example from this year, which was the uh, uh, Salisbury incident, uh, Scripple incident, when a uh, deadly nerve agent uh, developed for military use uh, was used in England. Here, uh, what happened, and if we think of the international cooperation, I think the United Kingdom was very fast to internationalize the problem for its own gain, meaning that UK went faster 
to the NATO, to the EU, and perhaps a bit on a different track to the United Nations uh, as well. What happened in the NATO was that um, all the NATO countries very fast uh, adopted a NATO position and then a similar took place within the EU. Essentially, these documents were more or less the same. Here, uh, you'd have uh, 35 countries, EU plus NATO, all agreeing uh, that uh, it is not acceptable what has happened in Salisbury, condemning it rather strongly, and also uh, stating that uh, most likely uh, this uh, event uh, emanated uh, from uh, Russia. Then after that, uh, a mass expulsion of diplomats, uh, I think almost 30 countries expelled diplomats, took also place in a framework of this international cooperation. So I think also this is uh, um, opera operationalization of international cooperation when there was a framework of like-minded countries that uh, gave a rhythm to our uh, shared joint uh, action. Later this year, I think both EU and NATO in their summits, uh, European Council in June, and then uh, the NATO summit uh, made decisions on new items, how to counter hybrid warfare, hybrid threats. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at to the EU, I think currently one can see at least sort of three bigger work strands, thematic ones. One is um, the EU's action plan countering disinformation, I think just adopted a few weeks ago, which will give EU, but also nation states, member states, and <clears throat> uh, tools to counter uh, malign systematic disinformation, and also tools to, for cooperation. Uh, EU, I think, will soon come up with the election package aimed to all the member states on uh, <clears throat> how to defend the integrity of the elections that is coming up next year. I mean, obviously we're speaking of the um, European elections, but at the same time many countries, including mine in April, will have national elections as well. I think uh, this uh, will also uh, give us tools and we do not need to reinvent uh, the bicycle in every country. Uh, I think uh, international cooperation helps in that as well. At the same time, uh, and, and this I think is taking place after the OPCW, uh, the HOG September, uh, uh, within the EU, I think we're working on uh, <clears throat> how can we attribute uh, cyber attacks better? Uh, is, is there a way to do more sanctioning if something clearly unacceptable happens? So at least this type of things are going on within the EU alone. Uh, you may wish to take a look what's happening at the G7. Even the OECD is thinking what could their role be in countering uh, hybrid? I, I, I think it probably has to do with the uh, information awareness raising. Now, <clears throat> international, national I think we tend to argue that uh, primarily it is national responsibility to build resilience and to counter hybrid threats. Yes and no, because <clears throat> I think it is very important to have a national network worked uh, based uh, cooperation, interagency process that you work together uh, in order to, um, uh, to discover uh, and, and then to counter, uh, to prevent hybrid um, uh, influencing. Interagency work is very good, but at the same time I think we are in the process of building this international network as well. We will we'll have a national network, international. I think when these two react uh, we are all the time doing increasingly better. So we need to connect those two uh, networks. Uh, and uh, some things I think we do better in international cooperation. For example, attribution, that is naming and shaming. Uh, if we can improve within, for example, the EU, our shared attribution culture, I, I think this would be useful. Another thing is how to build deterrence. I think uh, we would know if um, you would have a certain amount of guns, how much do I need to deter you? In the nuclear sphere, we know the same thing. I think there's calculations on that. But what does hybrid mean for deterrence? How can we build deterrence prevention in countering hybrid threats? I think a final thing that also that we do better in the international cooperation is that when we engage with different social platforms, uh, be it uh, Google, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram and others, if a 
not so big country goes and tells them, look, there are certain accounts that we need you to close or some of the automated uh, um, bots that need to be closed. Uh, that's one thing. But if the EU goes there, uh, if there are big countries or if there is a coalition of several countries, I think uh, this uh, is a topical thing also for international cooperation. In Helsinki, Center of Excellence on Countering Hyper Threats has existed now for one year, uh, one year, four months. Uh, I think it is a, a, an excellent manifestation of EU and NATO cooperation. This Center of Excellence is not part of our government. It is uh, formally uh, sort of an uh, international uh, organization. 20 out of 35 countries, that is all the countries that are members of the EU, all that are members of the NATO can apply and join, that is 35 countries together. Presently 20 have done so. I think increasingly the center of excellence is giving rhythm and analytical impetus to the work of uh, EU, NATO, to international work more uh, wider. Now a few things about Geneva. Uh, getting back to uh, your question, uh, Tobia, Tobias, uh, I, <clears throat> it's not only my mother, I think other mothers are always asking what is the difference between cyber and hybrid, because I think this will lead us to this uh, question, uh, answer as well, because uh, they are two different things, but they overlap as well. In a way, uh, cyber, computers, technology, it is an often used tool in a hybrid operation be it cyber espionage, be it stealing of information by conducting hostile information influencing. But however, I think hybrid is also a domain in itself. And, and this, I think, is clearly an issue for the UN, for Geneva, uh, meaning that um, cyber is a domain where our lives are increasingly banks, schools, social networks, friends, uh, you name it. We are increasingly in the cyber. And cyber is a domain where we need to develop uh, or where we need to uh, create uh, global regulations. We would need increasingly to involve all the countries and people of the world because cyber, I think, will not only be our thing. It, it touches globally everyone, uh, everybody who's living on this planet. It will have an impact on everyone's future. That's why I think it's extremely important to be very inclusive. Uh, so uh, cyber is a new domain, new space for our lives. Uh, it is based on technology that will develop. I think we cannot turn it back. But if cyber is a place or domain, what then is hybrid? Hybrid is not a place. I think in essence, hybrid is nothing else but malicious, unacceptable, bad behavior. So in an ideal world, hybrid uh, would not uh, have to be. And. Uh, well, maybe I think in the discussion uh, we can speak whether one can, what's the relevance of disarmament or arms control perhaps in countering hybrid threats? Uh, can there be dialogue on hybrid or not? I mean, if you do something that's clearly illegal on my country, is there a need to negotiate? I mean, we can negotiate if on, on arms, uh, on cutting arms and stuff, but something, if you hack my uh, voting registry, What's the dialogue that is needed? I, I think this is a question. Uh, but then again, also here, why uh, is a relevant question. Why is it that someone may want to uh, try to cause harm to my society or my country that way? And maybe, maybe there is a space and place for dialogue in asking the why question, or, or unless it's too naive, I don't know. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for sharing your thoughts. Um, a lot of examples that you gave uh, of joint actions and cooperation, if I may be critical, I don't want to criticize, but being critical, uh, are actually coordination and cooperation among allies. So I thought what was really uh, interesting is when you said about global regulation uh, uh, of cyber, really global uh, um, cross transnational and even trans alliance uh, uh, cooperation, if, as you mentioned, maybe that could be naive, but let's hope it's not. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Sari, um, international law is an element uh, oftentimes of, or, or most oftentimes of international cooperation and, and, and referring to that, um, international law does contain the, the, the elements of sovereignty, of equality of, of, of states, maybe not in power, but in, in, in law. So, so how do you 
uh, take that from a legal perspective again. Um, how can international law be strengthened so 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 it can lead to increased cooperation? Uh, or you mentioned before instrumentalization. Well, actually, can we instrumentalize international law to actually counter instrumentalization or, or foster <laughs> cooperation and, and peace and security? Uh, how, what are your what are your thoughts on that? I mean, Thank you very much. So how do we strengthen international law? I think that's, uh, that's a very difficult question to answer, but let, let me try. So if you go back to, to the legal challenges that we're facing as a result of hybrid threats, hybrid warfare, and I very much like the ambassador's uh, take, I mean, essentially we're looking at unacceptable bad behavior. So if you're looking at the legal challenges that we're facing, I think there are two types of legal challenges. So as I suggested, most of what we see is best described simply as an instrumentalization of, of international law and of law. For what reasons? Essentially to serve the national interest of the country that is instrumentalizing the law. Okay, so taking a very realist perspective here, states use the law as a tool of their strategic policies as their foreign policies. So that means one of the biggest challenges that we face as a result of having the law instrumentalized against us, and I say us, whoever you are, this happens obviously to all states um, on, on a global level, so the biggest challenge that states face is essentially law being used to undermine their own national interests. So their adversaries or competitors are using the law in order to undermine states' own national interests. So I think we can't really get away, and this goes back to, to your point, I mean, how do we respond to the instrumentalization? Well, essentially, law has always been and continues to be a tool of foreign policy. So if we want to go with Clausewitz, uh, as you remember, Clausewitz uh, told us that essentially war is a continuation of policy, and we can say th the same thing about the law, certainly, that law in many respects is a continuation of policy. That's es essentially what we're seeing here. So we can't get away from the policy dimension of this, and we can't get away from the political dimension of the instrumentalization of the law and of how we respond to that instrumentalization. So I think that's the, f that's the first point that, that I would make. Now, the second point is that, of course, the kind of methods and tools being used to instrumentalize the law, plausible deniability, breaking the law, exploiting gaps, operating th below thresholds, these types of, uh, of, of maneuvers, if you will, are of course corrosive to the rule of law. So two problems that we're facing therefore, one, number one, law being instrumentalized for national security, for national strategic purposes, undermining other states' national interests, and this whole process in many respects is corrosive to the rule of law and undermines the rule of law at the international level. So how do we respond? And uh, I was fascinated to hear the ambassador talk about operationalizing because that's, uh, that's one of the suggestions that I would make as well. We need to, first of all, adopt an operational mindset. Now, I say this from a perspective which uh, sort of starts very much with the narrow view of hybrid warfare, so the military context. And we need to start treating law, certainly within defense, within the national security community, as another operating domain. So just as we treat space, not outer space, but sp space, time, for example, or cyber or the information uh, area as domains in the same way we have to start treating law as a particular domain in which operations are conducted by states. What's the advantage of doing so? Well, the advantage is that by thinking about law as a domain or environment of operations, we can start applying concepts of operational art to this particular domain. So for example, we can start thinking about how certain players, how certain actors maneuver in the legal domain, what sort of actions they take in the legal domain, what sort of adversaries or allied uh, nations or players are in the legal domain. I think from a, from a lawyer's perspective, again, I appreciate that this is coming more from the military context perhaps than, uh, than a broader context. But I would suggest from a lawyer's perspective, that's actually one very key step to start operationalizing uh, law by adopting this operational mindset to it. Secondly, I suggest that we, we ought to adopt a resilience mindset or resilience perspective to the law. Resilience is of course is a, is a term which uh, a principle which uh, has been used in, in recent years, has become quite popular with international organizations, uh, the United Nations for example, uh, but also with more regional organizations, the UN NATO. So what does resilience mean in the legal domain? What does legal resilience actually refer to? And I think it refers to two things. Well, first of all, it highlights 
that when we talk about resilience in law, we think about what kind of role law plays in making our societies more resilient. And this goes straight back to the ambassador's point that maybe we need to think about a global compact or global agreements to regulate cyberspace. So in other words, how can we use law, how can we use regulation, how can we use legal tools, normativity in order to solve certain vulnerabilities that we in our societies experience. Disinformation is another example. Disinformation is a non-legal problem, first and foremost. But of course, law has a certain role to play. So how can we filter out using law, using legal tools? How can we filter out the bad kind of information that is out there, if you will, the bad kind of actors? And, uh, and maintain a uh, more benign information environment. So the first side of legal resilience, in other words, is using the law as a tool in order to make our societies more resilient. The second aspect, however, of, uh, of resilience is, of course, applying resilience thinking to the law itself. So in other words, how can we make the law or particular legal systems, let's be a bit more precise, how can we make international law, for example, or national legal systems more resilient against some of the vulnerabilities that they are facing. I've been recently chatting with a colleague and uh, the, the term fake legal news came up. And it's not something which, uh, which I've sort of seen a lot being written about, but certainly if you think about it, for instance, take the Kurt Strait incident, what seems to be quite characteristic nowadays is that uh, different actors put out legal information and it's often very, very difficult for us to decide what that legal, inf how, how true that legal information is, how to assess that legal information. And you see how in the media, the media is struggling to make sense of some of that legal debate and legal discussion that is going on. So in the same way as we, uh, we think about the resilience of non-legal systems, we can start thinking about how, what does it mean to make law more resilient at the international level as well as the domestic level. Right. Um, on, so I think that is first of all responding to the uh, to the instrumentalization of um, of the law. Secondly, how do we strengthen the international system as such? How do we strengthen the rule based international order uh, as such? I think here a number of uh, of points come to mind. Well, first of all, certainly states can do an awful lot of uh, of strengthening simply by failing to undermine international law. If you think about uh, some of the uh, actors that we have seen and that we've mentioned before, but also if you think about uh, Western states, for example, and their behavior at the international level, certainly resisting from breaking international law, resisting from undermining it would certainly go a long way. Secondly, I suggest that uh, we need to defend some of the substantive values of the international order and come out in, in, uh, in defense of some of the liberal values that the international order is, uh, is actually enshrining. For example, in human rights, um, we, the Khashoggi uh, incident, again, is, uh, is an example where I think we, we see a general reluctance of states which have underpinned the international order to, to continue doing so. Finally, I would suggest that, uh, coming back to the point about uh, disinformation and fake news and also legal fake news, I think we need to defend the formalism of the law, and in particular the formalism of the international legal order. So what we see increasingly is perhaps the politicization, the instrumentalization of law. We see law increasingly being tossed around by states and uh, non-state actors as just another piece in the information puzzle and the information warfare that they, they fight. Of course, one particular response to that uh, is to, again, remember that law has certain rules. It has a methodology. There's a formalism to the law. So in other words, we can strengthen the institutions and the particular formal legal processes of the law and thereby essentially uh, provide a counteract to some of the politicization that we find going on at the international level. Thank, right. you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sauer, uh, for your thoughts your analysis. Um, thank you to both of you. I think in line with, with the topic, uh, 45 minutes later, there's more clarity, but I think there's also more unclarity. So at least I hope there's more clarity also about uh, on the unclarity. Uh, and with that, I would like to really uh, give you uh, uh, the floor, uh, invite you to jump up with, with questions, comments, critiques, uh, just whatever is, is, is on your mind. Um, the only thing, uh, we don't have a microphone in the room, so maybe if you don't mind standing up so, so everyone uh, here's uh, your, your, your intervention uh, well. Uh, that would be very appreciated. 
uh, uh, yeah, are there any, any thoughts, uh, reactions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to start by the end. Uh, I think um, in, in, let's say, practical ways, the application of law for very emergency weapons, something that perhaps you didn't know that exists, we have to go into the books and know exactly what these weapons are. For example, the microwave weapon that destroyed the human brain. So can be done in a very simple way. So by the time it gets to a group of people, or even diplomats, like the case of Cuba, and get a solution of what happened with the brains, with the brains of the diplomats. So you guys in the law, sitting in the law patamar of things, don't have the same speed that's necessary to actually counteract, especially if this is will increase in amplitude of the attacks, because it's very easy. Microwave attacks, it's a very short wave, and you can use a simple radar disk mounted in a truck. And, and the microwave radiation travels in little inches, and it's located out, out uh, opposite end of the electromagnetic radiation. So if you lawyers, and if you, the ones that make decisions, will know more about the practical things of the weapons. I'm not talking about chemical weapons. I'm not talking about radiological weapons or incidents. I'm talking about the ones that are happening now. And will happen more. By the time Mr. Putin and others will use again, it will be too late because you don't have even have a law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I, I give the word to both, like maybe a sense of, of, of prediction, of, of being forward thinking, or even if new technologies is actually the existing law or existing cooperation in foreign policies, are there actually a I mean, we just need small adjustments, or do we really need something revolutionary? Maybe for Sylvester. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I think rules-based international order to a large extent uh, would apply to the cyberspace, uh, for example, as well. Now, um, I think what well, you mentioned about the speed um, that it will happen again, perhaps not only that, but a variation of the thing in a bit different form. So I, I think the speed is really a challenge to most of us. Uh, speed uh, is a challenge uh, to open societies, because when we think of s things like uh, elections, uh, pluralism, uh, rule of law, if they are weaponized as tools against us or used as in instruments against us, we are being challenged. We are being challenged, especially in a short run, if should the um, adversary be an um, authoritarian actor. I think uh, open societies uh, we need to go through the forms, so it takes time when open societies get going, but I think eventually open societies uh, will prevail. There are lots of new technological things that one ought to study that link or don't link or maybe link. I've, I'm trying to learn what uh, 5G means and, and what are some vulnerabilities related to, to building uh, 5G. Uh, also, what you referred to uh, in your question, Tobias, uh, that is, is, is there only a coordination into international sea, scene? No, I think there is also lots of, lots of concrete uh, work. A few examples on the disinformation. Uh, I think uh, now this uh, EU's disinformation action plan will have a system of point of contacts inside of it. If uh, one country is suddenly heavily attacked uh, with a strong malign disinformation, there are several reasons why it is useful that we are interconnected. We hear what is happening in another region. It might, uh, in one country, it might starting to happen to us. Plus, in, in, in spreading the uh, narrative uh, and understanding is, is useful. Uh, increasingly, I think we are jointly analyzing and, for example, deconstructing malign information that is not only doing fact checking, which is one, but, but to do deconstruct it and then go to the why questions. Operational thing, if you look to the G7, I think they this summer opened an office of 20 or 30 people to um, detect uh, uh, 
election interference and in order to be able to react uh, and there is also a uh, uh, sort of data analytical element to there as as well as uh, counter uh, disinfo element um, I think there are lots of good practical examples and a little by little wheels are starting to move of course the problem is are we doing something that is history should we understand what will happen tomorrow or after half a year I think that is one challenge uh, speaking of legal aspects I think really some of the cyber attacks and cyber espionage is simply illegal but fake news is not illegal disinformation it's more difficult to tackle it through the legal uh, angle so there I'm not sure if it is the sort of if the legality is a question to disinfo or if, if there is a mother um, obviously race speech and stuff like that is, yeah. is then at the extreme but uh. no that, that is certainly an, uh, one of the difficulties that we find in, in many of these areas uh, and, and of course almost by definition this is exactly what we expect hybrid adversaries to do to operate below thresholds to operate in a way which does not actually trigger some of the legal um, thresholds and uh, and reactions so in other words, uh, they're operating in a way which precisely circumvents the legal prohibitions that are in place. And I think that goes to your point as well, uh, in the sense that obviously we, wa we want law, whether it's in the cyber arena, whether it's in the information arena, or whether it's uh, to do deal with weapons, we want law to be robust and to be able to give us tools in which we can confront some of the, uh, the practices, for example, the one that you mentioned, the use of, uh, of microwaves. Now, that means we need to perhaps in some areas develop new rules. Cyber is a good example. Uh, with information, I, I fully agree. The, the difficulty that we have in the information domain is, of course, we don't want to go too far. We value the freedom of expression. We are open societies, and we want to keep uh, uh, these, uh, these values and we want to maintain these values. But nonetheless, law can certainly play a role in, for example, giving us a framework and giving us tools to, if not police that particular area, that's not necessarily what we want to do, but at least to, let, to draw some of the boundaries perhaps a little bit clearer than we have done in the past. Now, in that way, law is always catching up. It's ta catching up with technology. It's catching up with, uh, with the way people use technology. And it's precisely for this reason, I think we've got to be careful and not think of law and leg regulation as a panacea. Law, in most cases, is playing catch up. There will always be new technologies, there will always be new developments in societies where the existing rules are not tailor-made. And yes, of course, there are general principles, and, and, and we, cyber is a good example. There is not a, uh, a vacuum, a legal vacuum. Rules and principles apply. But nonetheless, law in many, many cases is playing catch-up. Now, what I think is new about our current situation is that we increasingly see a very strong link between law, legal argument, and the black letter of the law, if you will, on the one side, and information, strategic communication on the other. Again, it goes back to my point about instrumentalization of the law. If you look at the UK as an example, um, one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years, pretty much since 2003 and the, and the invasion of Iraq, is how just incredibly important questions about legality and the, the legality of foreign policy decision-making has become. It's absolutely critical uh, for the government's uh, action. So we've seen this in 2003 with Iraq, we've seen it more recently in Syria. So it's actually in, with that increased importance of legality as a justification for decision-making in government, in particular in the foreign policy area, where I think we see how it creates opportunities, if you will, for adversaries, malign actors, to start combining information operations with legal expertise. And we, we certainly see a lot of examples of that happening, uh, not just in, in, in the East, but also uh, in other areas in the world. So it is very much a global phenomenon. It's not just something that, uh, that uh, as I say, happens in the East. So I think there, my point is, if that's what we're seeing, if there's increasingly a link between strategic communication and legal argument and legal justifications, then responding to that requires capacity more than anything else. So in other words, it requires that speed. It's not necessarily speed in legislating and speed in coming up with new rules in order to deal with some of these problems, but actually speed in having the right people, the right expertise, and that is partly legal expertise, partly also uh, expertise in strategic communications to deal with some of these threats that we are facing. 
And as I say, that's a question of capacity and very much what I had in mind when I talked about operationalizing the, the law and the, uh, operationalizing the legal response. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, it strikes me that throughout the discussion, uh, you know, you, you talked about the various conference, uh, uh, concepts of hybrid warfare and the idea of, of um, clandestine warfare, I think, came through on, on both sides, right? These are all actions taken, um, you know, as whether during peacetime or, or declared war that are, that are not being done openly, right? And it seems to me that that is one of the sort of, you know, central challenges tying both of your presentations together, and that it really does, as, as you know, you were talking about the, the thresholds and the potential importance of legal arguments and, and legal mechanisms today, the pressure of, of ensuring that the facts that the law has to be applied to are obfuscated. Um, you know, has really created pressure on various states to make sure those facts don't come to light. Um, and I think, you know, you don't, you don't have to go to a really, um, you know, exceptional example, but I think even, you know, the use of chemical weapons in Syria, which is almost as conventional a warfare tactic as you get, you know, is, is they've, they've created le many legal blockages to get facts on, on, the, on the ground. Um, so I guess my question would be, um, what you see as far as whether it's it's um, political and uh, or or legal forms or or sort of you know whether it's it's greater reliance on on allies um, to try to forge a consensus view of what the facts are um, where you don't have the kind of you know you, you don't have security council views etc um, or there's alternatives in the legal sphere. To try to to try to clarify some of the facts. If I may, thank you very much. If I may take a second question too, so maybe then we can pass the word uh, to to both of you again, uh, sir. Yes, I'm uh, Michel from the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. When I listen to you, to the speakers about um, civil warfare or hybrid warfare, I just realize there's no relation between adversaries and opponents, you know, and therefore they use those methods, you know. How would it be possible to restore the relation by uh, diplomats and uh, using mitigation, mediation, conflict resolution? There are a lot of civilian methods just to re-establish those relations that have been uh, taken out uh, with this uh, uh, cyber warfare and things like that. Would it be possible just to mitigate, just to uh, have such a reliance uh, with those civilian methods, you know, instead of having those recourse to the same methods of manipulation and uh, cyber warfare and those fake news? Is it possible? What do you think? Thank you very much. The two brilliant, brilliant questions, one analytical, more or less, the other one more with, with, with action, action-driven and outlook, and maybe Dr. Uh, Sari and then uh, Ambassador. Thank you. Two, two very, very good questions, and I think they're, they're actually related um, in, in many respects. I think um, both of them raise a question about the rule of law, I think, ultimately, at least to my mind. It's a question about the rule of law, in the sense that if, you, if uh, there's disagreement about facts, the kind of factual disagreements that we see, for example, take the Kurds straight. Where exactly were the boats? What were they doing? What happened to them? How much force was used? Almost irrespective of what the actual facts were, what is really interesting to observe as a lawyer is that the players involved, and I'm not just talking about Ukraine and Russia, but look at NATO, look at uh, states which are, which are more aligned to, to Russia, virtually everyone is picking their favorite version of the facts and then ultimately play, creating legal narratives and creating cover stories and explaining why what they did was absolutely in compliance with international law and, and immediately, again, going back to the point about speed, you have statements, there seem very almost pre-prepared statements coming out with a very nice, quite detailed legal explanation as to why X state did the right thing and Y state did the wrong thing and was, uh, was, uh, was completely in the legal wrong. 
So what, what is problematic about this? And, and this is, happens in the real world, as with the Kurtz rate incident, happens in, in the cyber domain, happens in the information domain. What is disconcerting uh, about this, I think, is we lose touch with what the facts are, we lose touch with reality, and we lose touch with the ability of the law to actually tell us what is right and wrong. And that, I think, is absolutely corrosive to the rule of law. So basically, the legal argument just becomes another way of doing strategic communications. That is deeply, deeply problematic. And this happens at the international level. And if you look at how then that gets translated at the domestic level, you will see that in domestic discourse, citizens, uh, newspapers, the media basically give up on trying to resolve the factual issues because they can't. Uh, it's very difficult. I mean, of course, we know Bellingcat and various, uh, Bellingcat and various others, uh, other players are, are out there and trying to establish the facts, but very often that's impossible to do. And as a result of that, um, it's very difficult to actually figure out who was legally speaking right and who was legally speaking wrong. And that, I fear, is, is ultimately extremely corrosive to, to the rule of law and the utility of using law as a formal instrument to basically decide, as I say, who is right and who's wrong and decide on the uh, legality or illegality of actions. So I think uh, I don't have the answer to that one, I have to admit. So we did say that there's going to be more questions than, than answers. Um, of course, m the way one would hope is if there were neutral institutions, if there were neutral processes, mediation, etc., for example, uh, one could find out the facts and then one could find, uh, find also um, uh, the correct legal characterization of the situation. But of course, uh, the various players involved are, are not going to submit to these sort of institutions. Uh, we've seen that with the South China Seas, for example. Yes, there is a, there's an arbitration process going on, but what does it get us? Maybe to continue, thank you. Uh, uh, this uh, situational picture and the facts. Uh, I think the challenge with hybrid is that uh, hybrid act actions normally are deliberately ambiguous so that you don't know who's behind them even if you might know uh, always the the one who is behind them has a chance of deniability uh, plus uh, what is typical for the hybrid actions there is no sort of normal logic i mean uh, the uh, there is no link between the actor the means used and the result, because if, if, if I do something, normally there is a logical chain, but this relationship is also being blurred, among other things, in, in hybrid influencing, in asymmetric activities, whatever name you want to use. So therefore I think the situational picture is extremely important, be it nationally or be it internationally. If nationally we want to decide, it becomes very political, how can we react even if we feel that we don't know about the facts. Uh, I don't think there is 100% legal attribution, more or less there will be a political uh, element always, uh, especially if you want to react fast. Sometimes the facts come later because you can look at these pictures in the subways and stuff and sooner or later you can build the thing, but if you need to react fast. So the attribution is to some extent, it's political, it's connecting dots and other things. Uh, but I think uh, international is somewhat shared enough situational picture is, is important for making uh, joint international uh, decisions. Uh, now, restore relations with the um, adversaries. Uh, is it possible to negotiate on hybrid uh, uh, threats, hybrid um, uh, influencing? Uh, I, I think I if you go to the OSCE, there is now this uh, structured dialogue which actually relates to conventional arms control. But it, under the OSCE structured dialogue, they have tried also to discuss about hybrid threats and what could we do to mitigate. Uh, uh, but this within the OSCE, it is undisputed thing whether one should bring this to, to a discussion that has to do already a challenging thing at present situation, conventional arms control. Uh, also at the NATO-Russia Council, I think w when they meet, uh, they would try to have an exchange on hybrid uh, threats. Uh, but I mean, we've had situations, uh, for example, in Australia, there, there's been a big Asian country that has um, 
practically gotten their people elected to the Australian Parliament more or less uh, uh, through um, economic means and stuff like that. Uh, uh, I mean, if some things really hurt my sovereignty, uh, is, th is there a dialogue or negotiation for that, or is it really the uh, why question that uh, why is it that you do that? Uh, but if, when you ask the why question, for example, in Europe today, then obviously I think very soon you would get into the questions of our present security challenges. You would get to the questions on what principles uh, should we build the so-called European security structure on. So uh, I, I think these things are quite interlinked. Uh, Yes, sir. Maybe also we take two questions. Uh, maybe yes, sir. With the, uh, yeah. Just in second one. Not, the before, not before the second one. Sorry. You said two questions. Yeah, we already got the two for first row, so we're good. Okay, uh, we'll be the last. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. You. Um, so we we talked a lot actually about hybrid warfare uh, from the perspective of Europe, Western countries. Um, and so it was interesting to maybe follow up the point on the, uh, basically the, the kind of global governance and global coordination perspective. If we uh, take into account that uh, where war is being waged today is in a number of contexts like the Sahel, South Africa, etc., environments where you have strong strategic stakes indeed from the Western countries who most of the time are actually involved uh, to open operations, but also like their counterparts, the countries, the actors on the ground may not have the capacity indeed to um, uh, that the, the Europeans or the Americans have in terms of, uh, of uh, countering hybrid warfare. So I would be interested to have your perspective in terms of how this global coordination or regulation would function in a context where there is so much disparity in terms of capabilities. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, um, one of you refer to instru and instrumentalize against us. That was part of a sentence. Who are us and who is us? And in the upcoming wars, how many sides will there be and where will be the side? Because you see, when you refer to hybrid wa warfare and you say it's a bit like cyber warfare, but not quite. If you lure a rocket, an enemy rocket, then it's a technical issue. The most technologically advanced will win and, uh, and the poor countries will win. If you spread fake news, then it's a communication issue, which is not an easy one, but still if there is solidarity in the society and in the past when there was strong solidarity with uh, the authorities, uh, fake news and fake news could be marginal. But when you spread dissent, and people today don't know if they love Europe more than their own country, that the great issue of sovereignty, or whether they prefer jihad to etc. It's very difficult to know who are us, who is us, and which laws are you referring, or national laws, or the enemies law. And in Switzerland, we just voted on that, uh, if even if and his law might be an overstatement. So how do you cope, the three of you, with that issue? And maybe a second side question. I heard that microwaves can damage brain, which may be true, but does it damage brain more than schools, media, or, uh, uh, let's say, debates? Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> maybe, maybe since we said two questions, we're limited <laughs> to the two. Uh, uh, if, if I may, uh, whoever wants to pick up, uh, step up first. I can uh, shoot first. Um, disparity in capabilities, um, or perhaps uh, sharing the situational picture. Um, I think uh, if you go, for example, to uh, Mexican government, they would have interesting uh, sort of views on outside election interference to their uh, elections, uh, presidential elections last summer. Uh, globally, uh, I think in Africa there are lots of things going on also in terms of a sort of big power pressure that uh, 
there again the means used are different. South China Sea was mentioned as well as Australia. Singaporeans and Indians have their own views. I think uh, countries like Brazil or South uh, or Chile, I, I, I think um, now that we have coined this expression more or less in the last five years, we start to use it more and more, rightly or wrongly, uh, I don't know. But I think uh, it should refer to behavior that is not acceptable. And uh, uh, disparity in capabilities encountering it, yes, perhaps, or lack of international cooperation could be. But here again, I think if you look at a situation, if you have a war in one country, it's different than just a sort of uh, uh, covert uh, uh, illegal activities. Uh, who, who is us? Uh, I think in a way us is all that just want to live uh, normal lives and have the rules of our societies uh, respected. Maybe us is the people who want to preserve the integrity of our uh, electoral process and uh, pluralism, uh, for example. I think that's one more um, idealistic question. Uh, who is us? I think, uh, as I was uh, uh, saying in the beginning, could be that it's easier to find us in Brussels because of EU, for example, than uh, here uh, because of uh, uh, being a, a global capital in, in different way, Geneva. Here, the unfortunate thing, unfortunately, is that hybrid influencing is divisive amongst uh, ourselves. Uh, but who is us in regulating cyber, for example? Uh, I think there in cyber, us is all of us because uh, uh, I think we would want to make cyber to help, uh, help everybody in the world to enjoy free, responsible internet uh, uh, cyberspace uh, and able to get economic, educational, whatever gain. Uh, hybrid, I think, is different. Cyber is, but hybrid would not have to be so. Rules-based international order, I think this is a challenging thing um, because in essence, I'd, and I'm sure you know better, but the, we sometimes want to speak of it in a very Eurocentric uh, way of something being invented after the Second World War. I think in wider, this countering hybrid threats also has to do in defending uh, rules-based international order. And I think this is an issue that we should really speak about and tackle more globally maybe to find more global consensus on rules-based international law because I think it is a useful thing for me personally coming from a small country but I, I think for most of us. So on the uh, hybridization and, and capabilities or capacities, I, I think we should probably resist the, uh, the urge or the trend, is perhaps the better word, of, of applying this hybrid construct uh, to you know, global issues and global problems, because I think it stretches this idea of hybridity so far that essentially what we're talking about are, are security threats, security challenges. And uh, there's, there's very little added value that the concept of hybridity actually brings to that sort of debate. And it probably actually clouds the debate more than, than it illuminates. So having said that, I think there is utility in engaging with the hybrid debate and whether it's the center in Helsinki countering hybrid threats or just thinking in, 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 in these sort of terms because certainly what it has done over the last five years it has pushed up far higher on the agenda certain security challenges and it has galvanized certainly within Europe within the European Union with NATO and across the nations it has galvanized the response and I think that's where I see a link between capability and capacity and security challenges. The fact that we have nations and international organizations increasing their capabilities to deal with, let's call them hybrid threats or hybrid warfare threats or whatever, or just call them plain security challenges, whatever we call them, the fact that they are increasing their capabilities to deal with disinformation, for example, to deal with some of the conventional threats that they're facing is a good thing. So that's where I see a link between hybridity and hybrid threats as a very pragmatic kind of process 
and capabilities. But I would, I would suggest from an analytical point of view, applying that concept of hybrid threat, hybrid warfare across the globe, I think it stretches it just extremely far. And that's not what I mean. Maybe, there is Maybe I misunderstood. Um, I was, I was willing to actually um, apply what we what you said in terms of the definition of hybrid war and also of cyber threats to yeah. context where current <coughs> war is being waged. So typically in a context like Sahel or yeah. take any other context where you have a city war, definitely the, uh, the question of the manipulation of information, yeah. social media, and uh, potentially cyber threat can apply as well. Yeah. But it applies in an environment where, where indeed you have countries which are very little capacity mm -hmm. So I was yeah. copy based on my you know, concept. Yeah. But looking at how this stretch actually apply and how the international community can get prepared and support in their lives with this environment. I don't think there's I mean it was not really legal but more kind of about the, the evolution of, of the way the war is being waged in certain environments yeah. and it's rather surprising today. I think the point is that uh, whatever we call it, we are facing these problems that you just described, whether we call it hybrid or not hybrid, and, and there's no question that we need to increase our capacities to dealing with those kinds of threats. And, and a lot of that has to do with, with the divide between the conventional, the non-conventional, the real domain, the cyber domain, et cetera, et cetera. On the who is us, I, I absolutely love that question, so I have to, have to admit who is us. Um, it goes back to the point that I, that I said that we can't really divorce the legal issues here from the political one and we can't really divorce the law from policy. Ultimately, I think one way of looking at, uh, at our present situation is that there are states and actors that are committed to a status quo, call it rules-based international order or call it what we will, the status quo. But at the same time, we have actors who, who are revisionist powers and who challenge that status quo. Why they do it? Coming back to the why question, well, because their real perceived national interests seem to be dictating that, uh, just as with status quo powers, their national interests, real or perceived, are dictating what they are doing. We can't really get away, I think, uh, that when we're looking at law as an instrument and we're, when we're looking at the instrumentalization of the law, ultimately why and how and what, for what purposes different actors are instrumentalizing the law, it's not a legal question, it's a policy question and a political question. So therefore the us is essentially all of us, whether it's Western states, Western organizations, global international organizations, or Russia's or China's or, or non-state actors, um, all of us are increasingly facing the, that sort of instrumentalization of the law that I described. Thank you very much. Maybe a last round of questions. We have five minutes uh, left, so we'll just take as many as are there are, and the more questions there are, the shorter you have to be. I know this is really challenging, but it's a challenging topic, so let's keep it that way. Yes, maybe uh, the lady, uh, then the gentleman back there, and then the gentleman uh, in, in, in the middle. Um, just a quick uh, question of curiosity. Uh, I was wondering what's the position of non-EU and non-NATO states uh, uh, in relation to that concept of hybrid warfare, because you both mentioned Russia as an example of a state that uses hybrid, hybrid threat, but my question is what does Russia think about it, and does Russia think that the US, for instance, is using I hybrid threats in Syria, for instance, through the use of, of proxies? Um, so that was the first question. And the second one, a question of clarification, uh, Dr. Sari, I, first I, I heard you saying that we have to stop using law as a domain, and then I think that in fact we have, we have to start using law as a domain, right? Okay, so that, that sounds very scary to me. So, um, can you can you develop on that, and, and what what would it would like would, what would it look like? Uh, so you say the, uh, applying concept of strategy to the legal domain, but so yeah, concretely, how, how would that look? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Behind. Um, so I have to admit that, um, now going back to the Western Europe thing, I agree that um, NATO and EU cooperation is definitely essential to countering hybrid warfare. On the other hand, because uh, Russian influence has gotten so strong in Europe, it's very hard to counter it now that um, Russian-sponsored political parties have in greatly increased your skepticism. Uh, and on top of that, um, uh, when talking about legal reforms, places in places like Hungary use these legal reforms to cement authoritarian rule and undermine European values. Um, so in that respect, I am a little bit skeptical that uh, such a strategy could work out in the long run. Um, do you know any ways that uh, such a strategy could be maintained? Thank you, sir. I was actually just going to pick up on that question about 
what 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 a sort of a, a, a legal domain in, 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 a, in a military staff would look like, um, and also how that would. I mean, I, I found the I found the idea a little bit interesting, but then when you were making your point about the importance of the rule of law and the law as a kind of a neutral standard, how those two, how you see those two fitting together. Very much so. So potentially even a contradiction between making it a legal domain and actually no having something overarching that is not a domain actually where you don't or, or at least the, the battle is kind of guided. Uh, any last question? No. So uh, yes, so yes. yes, sir. J just a comment because Mister uh, about restoring relation between uh, the nations and opponents. You mentioned OCDE and NATO are more or less military, you know, uh, bodies. And in Geneva, here, we have diplomats, and civilian diplomats. They can just come together and restore this relation with uh, conflict resolution. And I think here is a place where we could do it. Very good. We should bring more hybrid here. I think that's what the GCSB <laughs> and our moderator is doing. Thank you for that. So, so, so thank you. I'd, lo I'd love to stop here now <laughs> because this is awesome. But I think we, we do have to uh, respond quickly. So maybe uh, uh, Dr. Carlos, sorry, yeah, uh, and then uh, last word to, to Ambassador uh, Keenan. To pick up on some of the points, uh, so what, what does Russia think? Well, Russia accuses the West exactly of the same points. Pretty much exactly the same things. So there's this famous uh, piece written by the uh, Chief of Defense uh, Staff, uh, Valery Gerasimov, in 2013, which uh, very often is described as the Gerasimov Doctrine of Hybrid Warfare. Basically, what, what that article does is it expresses some concerns about how the West is operating with color revolutions here and there, and how the West is using uh, the media, and how it is using NGOs and civil society to essentially undermine various regimes around the world. Now, this wasn't actually a doctrine, a Russian doctrine and a Russian general explaining how Russia would do things. No, that was actually fair, squarely pinning the blame on the West, how the West is operating, how the West is utilizing non-kinetic means, etc., non-kinetic effects to, to achieve uh, essentially uh, revolutions in various countries. So the, the, the Russians have been thinking along the very similar lines, but not using uh, the hybrid terminology. So they've only recently started to use it, but actually they've, they've, uh, they've tra and I'm not a Russian speaker, but as far as I understand, they've virtually taken that phrase hybrid warfare and translated it um, into, into Russian. So, uh, so Russia is very much thinking along similar lines, but using different terminology. On um, operationalizing the legal domain, so, so again, with apologies, so I, I've thought about this very much from a quite narrow military context, if you will, defense context. And what I would s say is, uh, well, simply integrate law and lawyering into the targeting cycle, which in many respects we do already. And a good example w for that would be freedom of navigation operations, where actually what you do is you use the operational effect, you use ships basically, as a supporting role and, and, and as a supporting uh, effort in order to achieve the main effort, which is a legal one. So we do that sort of stuff already, where we are using operational things to support the main effort, which is something in the legal domain. Question is, how well are we doing that? Are we properly integrating that into the targeting cycle? And to resolve the contradiction, of course, it matters, again, taking us back to policy, it matters hugely for what purposes and for what reasons we're instrumentalizing the law. We instrumentalize the law, human rights law, you can think in, 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 in or international criminal law is a way of instrumentalizing legal in law to achieve certain effects, benign good effects, it's, but you can't get really get away of what for us is good and benign is not necessarily so for other actors, which takes us back to the politics of it. Can you just repeat the name of Gerasimov? Gerasimov, it's General Gerasimov. Thank you very much. Ambassador. Maybe uh, three points, uh, uh, please. Uh, there was a notion on uh, hybrid uh, threats uh, uh, being uh, done by using uh, parties in the EU countries or individual in EU countries as tools. Uh, yes, this might very much be the case. Uh, uh, and obviously, I think that is one of the used methods. But it, I think it's good to remember that here we do have a bigger challenge within us as well when it comes to the big data, artificial intelligence, then it's not uh, 
then, then it can be a domestic political med meddling and battling as well. Uh, if, if I speak of hybrid threats, then it is an external country uh, that is uh, using the influence. But uh, in, in politics, for example, uh, this technological development takes this issue a lot wider in, in general as well. Uh, I think, again, some good points were raised. Uh, whether this issue is sort of too Euro, Euro transatlantic center or, or global. Uh, I know that there are some people who argue that uh, hybrid threats is mainly an issue for democratic countries, for example. I'm not sure. Uh, I would, my instinct is to argue that it, it is um, more of a, a, a global uh, issue. Uh, but here, I think this is one of the things that I would not have an answer uh, for today, it's learning by doing. Um, yes, I think absolutely you're right that not everything needs to be uh, hybridized. Uh, it's, it's important to be, I think, calm and uh, analytical. And even if we live this hybrid age, I think there's lots of normal threats and <laughs> normal aggressions. Even if we live this hybrid age, there is no point of starting seeing everything through the hybrid lens. Uh, this certainly is not the idea uh, either. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Kim, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arosari, for 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 for, really for, your, for sharing your thoughts, for for sharing your insights. Um, I think it's a really hard topic, some hard questions. So 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 really thank you for, for taking the time, um, and thank you very much, distinguished guest, for 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 being here uh, today. I think we're really, really uh, good discussions now. We heard your call for more clarity or more discussions on this uh, topic before you even said it, of course. No, if you really want to uh, delve deeper into uh, the subject, uh, the Exeter University, uh, together with GCSP and others, uh, are, are, is organizing a conference on titled Legal Resilience in an Era of Hybrid Threats. And that's going to happen from 8 to 10 uh, April. Uh, Dr. Sari is really the, the driver behind this conference, behind the thinking that goes along. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really confident that it's really going to be a good uh, a conference. So on, on the outside, there are some flyers. So if you're interested, just, just take it up and, uh, and, and really you're warmly welcome. Now, if in general uh, you like uh, these type of debates of, 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 of contemporary issues, um, et cetera, the next uh, security and law reality check will be in February. Uh, it will be on a more traditional topic. It will be on the simple question, do the Geneva Conventions uh, matter? And that, uh, from a perspective, 70 years of Geneva Conventions next year, but also ongoing claims that actually international humanitarian law is not applied, uh, different uh, opposing narratives that actually is very useful. Uh, some, some argue that it's in the interest of states to uphold it, others uh, definitely not, etc. So we're, really, again, trying to bring a little bit of clarity uh, to the unclarity and have, have an interesting debate. So, so again, warmly in, uh, welcome. Uh, you're warmly welcome to, to join us uh, in February. And so that brings us back to, to the here and the now. Uh, in exactly one week is going to be Christmas. So I, I definitely uh, wish you a Merry Christmas. I wish you a great time uh, that you're spending with your loved ones or however you're, you're celebrating. Uh, so with that, uh, really enjoy this, this, this moment, enjoy this uh, time at the end of the year. And uh, hope to see you next year again. So thank you very much for being here.